What's going on, everybody? Welcome to another edition of Hi-Fi Hour. I am here with my good friend, Terry, from Premier. Premier. I said that right, right? Well, there, there's a little disagreement. It's either Primare, if you're Swedish, but that sounds too Italian. So yeah. we've kind of gone with Primare. Primare. I like that. It, it's a very uh, cool brand because everything I've seen about it so far has a very um like cool esoteric vibe you know a very european vibe you know mm -hmm. but it, like whoever did your graphic design did it completely right and we'll get into that in a little bit but uh terry how about you tell me a little bit about yourself uh your background in uh the industry and how you you know landed in sweden yeah well i've been doing um audio video uh, uh for about oh almost 50 years now actually starting when i was a wee lad 15 years old and uh, oh, I'm giving you the math now uh, to figure out how old I am. Um, but in every aspect of it, whether it's retail, distribution, manufacturing, spending most of my time, as you might be able to tell from my accent in the United States. And the last little bit uh, with the wonderful distribution company called Sumiko, um, who at one point uh, distributed among other great brands, a certain electronics from Sweden called Primair. And I grew to know the brand very well, began to work with them more intimately, more closely. And after I decided to stop uh, with my parallel career of film teacher and film producer, uh, decided to move to Sweden and work with Primer full time uh, for the last, say, five years. Oh, so you were in film production? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I did. Don't, don't be overly impressed. Um, uh, in the Bay Area, I was known for doing it fast and cheap. So if you uh, were ever hitting your deadline and, and you needed something that looked good but needed it done cheaply, you, you would call me. But it was mostly philanthropic uh, short subjects, mostly around the education uh, field. I worked for the Pearson Foundation. I was the executive producer for video for the Pearson Foundation, which is the world's largest education publishing and testing company. We did films about best practices in education around the world. Um, and then I also did some work for um, Dolby Labs when I was in uh, in uh, in the early days before it was called Atmos. We were describing how it was going to work, um, and then uh, did stuff for Autodesk, also based in San Francisco. But my my favorite is uh, the Smithsonian Institution, where oh, I work wow. with their Center for Digital Learning and Access, and I still do that a bit because it's just so much fun to go back behind the scenes in the museums, working with the curators, talking about art objects and historical artifacts and things like that. So, so yeah, so, so there's that experience, which proves to be very helpful. Um, you know, especially when we're now in the process of designing new multi-channel products. That's incredible. And you know, primary was a company that I was not on my radar at first because I mean, they are Scandinavian, so, uh, it's not like they have the hugest presence in, um, in mainstream, you know, commercial applications out here like you can't really find it at the best buy or at the magnolia this is some high-end stuff so i stumbled upon it at a, a small little hi-fi shop here in colorado called soundings hi-fi and their uh their manager there could not stop singing their praises and because I, I explained to him i'm like okay i'm in a dilemma okay i i want to position myself as the cd guy because i love the format I have a mm -hmm. passion for the format. I grew up with the format. Well, uh, I grew up with cassettes, but I grew up, I, I saw the evolution of the CD uh, as I got older. So I wanted to get into that ecosystem. And uh, he suggested the Primair DD15 paired with a, a competent DAC when the DD15 is a transport. So that does not, for those that don't know, transport to CD player, CD transport has no DAC, CD player has a DAC. You can, figure that out i guess but uh, <laughs> but yeah he he really pushed it and pushed it and that's when terry and i started talking and i'm like well, what do you think you know and uh and it's actually happens to be sitting right there a lot smaller than i expected but a lot <laughs> heavier than i expected so it's a is a small form factor where you can actually probably fit a small dac or music streamer right next to it if you're using a normal sized uh, audio rack however it's heavy like i there's a lot of stuff going on in there for a, just for being a transport there's a lot of stuff going on in there so uh tell me a little bit about uh primary and you know what they 
what they value in their products. Like how, how does that look and sound so good right off the bat? Well, before we go any further, I have to have a shout out to the guys at Soundings um, because they're one of the best dealers in the country. And I say that not simply because they sell Primera, but I've had a long relationship with them, particularly when I was with the distribution company Sumiko. So you are fortunate to have them as a resource. And in fact, I would I would wish that everyone around the world had access to a dealership as good as they are. And okay. I say that not because of the products that they, they represent, but they're also really good about setup and they understand how important that is. Um, and I can't say enough about that. And so Rod, the owner and their team there, um, they're, they're really exceptional guys. So take advantage of that. Anyone in the Denver area, yeah, take advantage of that. Jess um, is the one but, I was talking to the most. Uh, Jess, he he was very very uh, informed on yeah. oh, everything, yeah. and his yeah. his ability to position speakers is mm-hmm. I think unmatched. So yeah, yeah, he's he's. Well, I will, I, will brag, I will brag a little bit. Um, that's a speaker technique that I may have taught him. Um, oh, or I know wow. I certainly taught Rod. That's because they all came to Sumiko where we taught the speaker setup training, both for two-channel and multi-channel, with the idea that really that's vital. That's absolutely vital. Mm-hmm. Um, and 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 so I so oftentimes I do customer service as well for Primera. You know, people will write me with questions about, oh, I'd like a little more base weight in my system, or I this is happening or that's happening. And it's almost immediate that you can understand that, well, I think maybe more importantly than buying a new product, work with your speaker positioning or, or work with how you've managed your power or, 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 or work with your network system. And so, so the guys at Soundings, they, they get that very well. And in fact, what's, what's almost bizarre for me, and I shouldn't go off on this tangent and I should talk about our product, but, but the one thing that's also strange for me as a customer service point is that we get all kinds of questions that I wish people felt they had a resource in a dealer to go ask them for direct help, for direct assistance. Because I think in a lot of cases, like with some place like Soundings, they'll get the best possible help. And and without maybe even having to spend a dime, um, just improve the quality of their system. Right, and that's one thing I noticed. um, uh, I've been to a few hi-fi stores in in, in the Denver area, and a lot of them make me feel like it's just a big sales pitch. You know, they kind of, they kind of, they're, well, they're salesmen, you know, they make commission. I understand. But at soundings, when I, when I approached them, when I went in there, they, they treated me like, like, like a buddy. They're like, okay, Hey, sit down, let's talk. You know, we, we sat down in one of their listening rooms and I no no joke. The two times I went, uh, because I was going mainly because I was interested in the, in the Boulder 866 because I was doing a review on it. (laughs) <laughs> uh, Boulder sent me out their 866, uh, amplifier, integrated amplifier. And, uh, I wanted to learn more about it, you know, cause I, I felt that uh, I just wanted to experience it a lot more. And they were actually using it in one of their, uh, one of their listening rooms. So we started with that and that's when the whole thing derailed from, from Boulder and went over to Primair because I was, I was interested in, in this, is the CD play, uh, CD players and CD transports. So when they, when well, they, no, and that's the best example because they talked to you, they learned about what your needs might be or, or, or maybe what you didn't even know you needed and then offer you some suggestions you otherwise might have. And it really is a shame, I think, that either either dealerships don't aren't inviting or because they're just not very well prepared or put together or they're so poised to for that immediate sale that they lose what I think is really fun about this and this is exchange of ideas as we listen to and build together systems. Um, it can really be remarkable. And I, I often have told people when I was doing these sales trainings and we were talking about store, showrooms is that they should be set up that you could charge a ticket to go in there. Mm-hmm. It's so much fun, and there's the stuff they have are so cool mm-hmm. that, like at a trade show where you would pay a ticket, there'd be a mini trade show where you should be able to come in and just be marveled or marvel at all the wonderful things that they have, like a DD15 CD transport, because that's not a normal piece of kit, and mm-hmm. that's not something that that, for, to be quite honest, we even really thought we would be building at this day and age, given how fast streaming is going. But we also knew, as I think you probably anticipate either feeling yourself or among other people out there, that there is still a lot of vitality in the CD playback medium. If for no other reason than you CDs now are incredibly low priced and you can grab all kinds of wonderful stuff that you otherwise might not be able to do. 
And so we felt the need to be able to provide a CD transport in part because we obviously are building, or maybe not so obviously, are building a number of integrated amps, preamplifiers that have built-in DACs, network players, those kinds of things. And there are certain advantages to having those built-in facilities in certain products. But of course, there will be those people who still want to play their CDs and want to play them at their best performance. And what we didn't anticipate when we built these drives to essentially be partners to these other products was how much demand there was for CD transports. Mm -hmm. And the only thing I can think of is that people were beginning to see maybe the end of the uh, the tunnel for CD, if you will, or end of the line for, for CD. And they had been maybe working with an older CD player as transport or whatever the case might be. And this idea that they were going to buy what might be their last CD transport. And so the interest in it has been really quite amazing. And I think partly due not only to people's general interest, but then once they got a hold of something like a DD35, a DD15 or a DD35, um, they understand the performance benefits that it can have. And I can go on and on about the DD15 and our transports if you just want me to, to go. But if you have specific questions, feel free to, to jump in. But in the case of the DD15, you're right, it's heavy. Mm -hmm. It's compact. And all of that leads to controlling mechanical resonances. And one advantage of the DD-15, one unexpected advantage of the DD-15, was deciding to use a slot drive. Mm -hmm. Now, we had expected when we uh, spec the TIAC slot load drive for the larger DD-35, that we would probably just use that drive for the smaller DD-15. But as it turns out, it just doesn't fit that three quarter size cabinet. Um, it, we could make it work, but it didn't look, it wasn't very elegant. And the problem with building any CD player, drive, disc, whatever it might be, and I think even Peter um, Lindorf spoke to it uh, when you interviewed him a while back, drives are hard. Finding drives are hard. Yeah, I was going to ask you that. Uh, okay, so th th they seem to be unicorns at this point because yeah. I, I have reached out to TIAC and I've reached out to Philips. I didn't yeah. reach out to Sony because I figured they weren't even going to talk to me. Yeah. But um, Philips confirmed that they're not making, no, they are no longer making CD drives. They're making like DD, DVD, CD things for their, for their products or whatever, yeah. but they're not making dedicated CD drives now. So I, that was confirmed. TX, they, they weren't too clear. So yeah. I think they wanted to know what, why I was asking, but I didn't, really, <laughs> I didn't really get it. <laughs> they probably thought you were one of our primary spies. Uh, I know I was, they were like, what do you, what, why, what do you want? <laughs> you know, but uh, you know, so can you confirm for me that these companies no longer are, are either no longer making them or are weaning off of them? Or is anybody actually stepping up to the plate and saying, Hey, we're going to continue making them. It is getting more and more difficult to find drives. And, the, and this, this actually has a few stages in it. Um, first, quality drive. Does it provide the performance? Um, will it give you the sound that you're looking for? Does it pull you know, the bits off of the disc in the way that you want it to do that you can work with it? Um, does it function well? Does it load easily? Um, is it a mechanism that not only uh, works right out of the box, but also will work for years to come? And then, which is very critical both for end users as well as for us, is there a supply of these drives? Does that, and so that means, are they going to continue making these drives? Because primary product life is at least five years. And so we can't possibly do or anticipate doing a production run that will cover five years. We're not exactly sure how this will sell. And so we have to do multiple production runs to be able to meet demand or to manage our inventory. Mm -hmm. And so that means that we need to make sure that that drive remains in its form. And so we need to be able to be sure either that they're going to make it into the future or that there are quantities of it, which is why the, the slot drive in the DD-15 is so beautiful. It's for cars. Is it really? There is a huge supply of drives just to serve the automobile industry. Well, well you got to think that a lot of the new vehicles out there do not have CD drives. Yeah, and a lot of the old vehicles do as well. And so there is this sense that they probably built this surplus. Of these. I'm sorry? Yeah, there's probably this huge surplus. Oh, yeah. 
Yeah, we have as many of these drives as we could ever possibly You're want. You're smart. No, we 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 have scars. We have scars <laughs> of the past because there were instances where, um, yeah, and, and it's not surprising that you got the information that you, that you got because there were instances about a decade or so ago, uh, particularly with the development of DVD, there was a thought among many manufacturers that DVD ROM or CD ROM drives were going to be the way to go. It would play video, it would play audio, it would play SACD, it would play DVD audio. All of those things uh, were great. The problem is, is that we in our industry didn't anticipate that the CD or the computer industry uh, believes in not as long-term reliability as we might want for um, a consumer audio. Mm -hmm. and, and let alone that they might, they might have to meet the demand of a much larger manufacturer and therefore a drive that we were using may be subtly changed in their next production run of it. And so we would have to modify our player or our transport before we did another production run. So it became very difficult um, uh, to continue with that. And it remains a little bit difficult to find and keep uh, quality parts in stock. Um, and so we were worried that we might not be able to build these transports uh, or these CD players. And so we discovered the TX. And we got assurances from TIAC that they would be building these drives for a considerable length of time and or have supply that we would anticipate we would uh, need for the coming years. Um, and that if there should be any issues that they would inform us so that we could stock up. We already have a room, I mean, a room full of drives, of replacement drives, just for parts of older designs. And in the case of the Philips, there's just such a huge quantity of um, that we will never have a problem finding those drives, um, even if we don't already have them in stock. But the other beautiful part about that drive is that it was built for the auto industry. And so it has a couple of advantages. One, it is built to work in the most hostile environment possible. Absolute heat, absolute cold, vibration, dust, all of those things, this thing is designed to withstand. Now you're going to put it into a transport that sits neatly on your equipment shelf in a lovely room that will never, that will never experience those kinds of conditions and therefore should play forever and forever and forever. The other amazing thing, and we really didn't anticipate this. I hate to, I hate to make it sound like we're just, you know, inexperienced people building things, but we didn't anticipate how good this drive would sound. I mean, mm -hmm. we were, thinking, oh, it's made for a car, it can't be that good, but man, it is, and part of it has to do with the resonant uh, characteristics of it. It's, it is designed obviously to withstand shock and resonance. And so that drive is just absolutely stable. And so when you put it in that small box, you put it in with this massive weight, it has this stability that translates not only in just sitting on the shelf, but also in how that disc is rotated to get the information off as cleanly as possible. And so that's, that's kind of the key thing there. Drives are, are at the heart of it. And then for us, as with any design, power supply. Mm -hmm. uh, power supply is easily the most important part of any design. And it's easy to say it, but it's like the foundation of a house. You have to have that there. Everything rests on that. And in fact, even more important than the foundation of a house, it actually gives you the ribs, the bones, the structures upon which you set up the entire house. And so in the case of the DD-15, we actually have a couple power supplies in there. There is a switch mode supply uh, for the standby mode, uh, just sitting there, getting a little bit of power so that it's ready whenever you are uh, to respond to the remote control. And then once that's taken out of circuit, once you come out of standby, we have a linear supply. Uh, that's designed to then best suited to driving that particular drive. And then that supply is isolated from the digital output, and that's key. Um, I think what people don't really understand about digital, whether it's streaming or whether it's even stuff coming from in close proximity like a CD, is that there's always that potential for noise. Whether that noise is airborne coming from outside of the product, whether it is an electrical noise that might be part of the AC system or the connection system of one kind or another, or the noise that can come from a power supply. And it doesn't matter if it's switch mode or linear, all power supplies will have some level of noise involved. And it's a matter of designing them for the least amount of noise and then protecting the uh, output from any possible noise that might remain. And by doing that, you just get this clean, pure sound. Um, and I, I, I will tell a little secret because to a certain degree, as, a, as the guy was also responsible for marketing, um, it frustrates me to no end that we don't really have much in the way of brand recognition technology to talk about. It's part of our practical design approach. It just doesn't fit 
our approach to this to choose things for marketing purposes. We choose them because they make the best sound. And so when we were doing these drives, we figured, okay, in fact, I have to admit, I was responsible for this suggestion. You know, jitter, we have to consider that. It's very important. Maybe we need a jitter reduction circuit. And so we have a really gifted engineer by the name of Bent Nielsen on staff. Otherwise, we hire specialist engineers. So someone specialized in power supply, someone specialized in DDA conversion stages, someone specializing in output stages, digital control systems, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We tap these guys to provide their best thoughts, given their amazing talent and experience, in part so then we don't have to have a, uh, try to have a full-time engineering staff that has this level of capacity. So it saves us some money, and we also get just the best possible work. And we're fortunate in that Ben, um, the engineer that's been with us from the very beginning, has this uncanny ability to take all of these kind of disparate circuits and put them together in a way where they work their best, where they work most sympathetically together. It is that cliche of the sum being better than the parts. And he just has this knack for doing this. And so he worked with a couple of people to put together some jitter reduction circuits. We listened to them and we thought, well, maybe we just don't know how to design a jitter reduction circuit. And so we decided we would reach out to the highest recommended jitter reduction circuits that were commercially available that you could buy, tweak. And we installed those and then we came to the realization that we just don't like the sound of a jitter reduction circuit. And that we were able to get better results by really, really working hard on the power supply, making sure the digital output was clean, making sure that that transport was as isolated as it possibly could be. Um, and that gave us the best performance. And I think that's maybe what you're hearing is you just have that sense of directness to it. There's, mm -hmm. there's just not a lot of stuff in the way. And that's kind of how we build all of our products. Before I, I give my, my full disclosure <laughs> uh, opinion, because this is obviously going to be followed by a full review of the unit from, uh, from my channel. But, um, would you recommend putting, uh, upgrading the power cord? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, and, and that's part of it. And I, I shouldn't be so blithe when I say that. Um, we spec a really good generic cord. And for most intents and purposes, someone can use that and the performance of the product will be very good. In fact, we do most of our prototyping with these cords to make sure that when they go out the door, they sound good. The issue here for us is that there are a lot of good sounding power cords out there, much in the same way there are a lot of good isolating feet um, and so to a certain extent, both power cords and isolation feet can have real benefits. And it just depends upon what you want to choose or how much you want to invest in it. And so you'll find this across our line where, where there are things that you might have expected us to provide or maybe we could have provided, but with the idea that we can keep the price low and then allow people to choose those ancillary components, those accessory components that fit their budget, fit their needs, both system and, and, and their interests. And so you'll see that a lot in, in many of the things that we do, um, whether it's in the Prisma technology where we, we actually rely more on things like AirPlay, Comcast, uh, not Comcast, Chromecast, um, and, and, and other functionalities to be able to do the streaming. In other words, to streamline everything and allow people to simply select what it is they want to use in the form that they want to use it. So um, I would suggest, yeah, a good power supply, a good power cord could uh, help that power supply given the level of noise that might be in your AC system. Yeah, I've, I've been lucky enough to build a, a really great relationship with uh, John over at Audience AV. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I use 90% of my cabling I use uh, is Audience cables. Um, aside from a couple of Audio Quest digital cables because audience doesn't make digital yet. So mm -hmm. I don't know if they're going to, but uh, I needed some good, a good optical, good coax. So I said, audio quest might be the, the way to go there. So yeah, audio, um, quest. audio quest is doing a great job. In fact, it's kind of amazing how across their line, um, it is such a consistent line of cables. You can't really pick out one, you know, interconnect cables are better than their speaker mm -hmm. cables or their digital cables or what. They're just doing a very consistent job. So that's always a safe choice. I'll be honest. I used to be, used to, is the operative phrase, <laughs> uh, be a cable denier. And, ah! and, and, and my, my brother who uh, worked for um, Audio Quest for, for a, a moment in time, mm -hmm. he was just like, what are you, what are you doing? Why, 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 why don't you? <laughs> 
why don't you believe? <laughs> you know, it's like it's like he was trying to talk to me about religion. Yeah. And, <laughs> and it I'm does like, get that heated sometimes. I'm like, dude, why are you so passionate? He's like, because. He's like the, the how they manufacture it, 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 all this goes into it, and that it matters, you know. And, and I'm like, okay, okay, okay. So I I tried the audience stuff. Mm-hmm. I did notice certain things. Mm-hmm. However, I don't have a perfectly soundproofed room or sound uh, treated room. Mm-hmm. So the day I had my re- 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 revelation. My, re- mm. my re- revelation was when I went to soundings mm-hmm. and he sat me down. Uh, it was a couple of uh, Vienna speakers. Mm-hmm. And um, this is the first time I actually heard the Lingdorf uh, integrated amp, mm-hmm. but uh, he had two different types of cables and he's like, okay, I want you to hear, I want, I want you to see, I want to see if you can hear any difference between the, the Nordost and, it was called Isotech or something like that. Yeah. <clears throat> so he tried it. And the first one was the, I think it was called Isotech. Mm-hmm. Um, and I liked the way the Isotech sound. And then he put the Nordost in. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, a lot has just changed right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think the misconception that people have is they are, they think either, okay, I'm going to spend X amount of money on cables and it's going to make my system just sound like a, from, from a $5,000 system to a $20,000 system. That's not the case. Mm-hmm. That's where people kind of get it wrong. This isn't going to greatly and vastly improve the quality of the sound. It's going to almost manipulate the tone a little bit where it, it'll give you some features that you possibly may not have heard before. Mm-hmm. Now, if you're going from like lamp cord to that, yeah, you're going, you might have, you know, a huge, a huge difference in, in, in a huge increase in quality, but I, I didn't believe, I didn't try, like, I believed it, but I was like, oh, until I saw, I heard the AB, yeah. I'm like, okay, th- th- there's something here. There's something definitely here. And, well, we'll yeah, and, 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 and in some cases it can have a negative effect as well. I mean, it all right. depends upon, it all depends upon the nature of your system. And so, and so the best approach is exactly the approach the guys at Soundings took with you and that you were willing to sit down and listen, it's just listen for yourself. And it could very well be, that for you, this is not a significant enough difference. And this is where it's kind of driving me crazy right at the moment. And maybe I'm just a little oversensitive or old and grumpy these days. Um, the kind of social discourse, the social media discourse that's going on that is just, you're wrong. I can prove it with science. My science is better than you. Tech, specs, whatever it might be. The thing is, is that it all matters mm-hmm. to one degree or another. And it just depends upon the nature of your system, what demands that system might make, what you might make upon that system. But I would always have people give the um, give the benefit of the doubt and just try it for yourself. And it may not have those benefits. And you're exactly right when it comes to that that kind of thing where it may not necessarily be transformative. But my favorite thing when I was doing sales, this is going to sound horrible, but we had something called the puppy dog close is what it was called. And it's essentially based on the idea that a puppy has followed you home and can you keep it? And so you would let people borrow the equipment and they would take it home. They would listen to it over the weekend. And even if they came back with the equipment and said, you know, I didn't really hear that much of a difference or it wasn't important enough to me, uh, I'm going to return the gear. And then they'll go home and almost, we could almost time it 48 hours later. Um, hey, I borrowed that uh, power cord the other day and I brought it in. Could I, I'd like to buy that now because once they got used to that sound and then it was removed, that was far more critical as far as their listening needs than they might have when they were just doing their quick A, B. Mm-hmm. And so there is that sense that you have to live with it for a little while. You have to then then remove it from the system. And see if then it confirms that it's had the effect that you want to have it. But everything matters. I have a a dear friend of mine, one of the guys who was partners in Sumiko, as it turns out, Sterling Trail, who does uh, uh, this wonderful system optimization optimization around the world. And um, sorry about that. And, um, And he comes to visit me every once in a while. And he, even though it's his job, he loves helping me set up my system to see if we can tweak my system a little bit better. And the first thing he does is he pulls all the equipment out of the rack. He pulls the covers. He takes every connector out, every Molex, every connector out, and cleans every possible contact point he can. 
And of course, I'm just anxious to get the system back up and, and start playing with the system. And he does this preparatory thing. And, and so I'm on him on it, about, on, on him about it all the time. And he goes, yeah, 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 just patience. And then he plugs it back. In. And without having changed anything, there's just this little veil that's kind of dropped from the system. Mm -hmm. That over time, oxidization, whatever it might be, um, has taken place. And so all these little things matter. And then actually, I'll tell, you, I'll tell a Denver story, if you don't mind. The guys at, at, at AIR uh, in, the, in the Colorado area, um, uh, they were using the, um, uh, the Curtis Myrtlewood blocks to put under product. And it has an effect. I mean, you're changing the resonant characteristics of the player. So like with the DD-15 you've got back there, you could put different isolation feed under it, be they Myrtlewood from Cardiff or advanced magnetic things or whatever you might want to put underneath there. And it will alter the resonance of that system, which may or may not alter its output, its performance in your system. And so one year I went to a show um, uh, with Rocky Mountain and they put the Myrtlewoods under some of their product and it made them sound slightly better, subtly better, better enough where you didn't really want to take the blocks out. And then the next year, and this may be a bad story to tell, actually, I may be telling tales. Um, I saw that they had some blocks there, but the blocks were different. They had material of different thicknesses, three different thicknesses on top of the blocks. And then they did the demo for me and they slid them under the, under the equipment and they each had a slightly different effect, some better, some worse. Um, and I said, well, that was very interesting. It was an interesting experiment. What's the material? And they said, beer coasters. They had taken different thicknesses of beer coasters. They were at a bar one night. They saw the different thicknesses of the various types of beer coasters. They put them on there, they glued them in place and found out that it changed the resonant characteristics, that, that relationship yes. of the product to the shelf. Oh and goodness. so all of that stuff can make a difference, whether it is psychological, and I will freely admit that much of this is psychological, um, or, or if it has a genuine benefit, uh, and if it has a genuine benefit sufficient enough then it might be worth considering buying. Well, including the system. I have a good story for you then now. That ah. We're swapping stories. So when I was at Soundings, yep. Cables was not the only demonstration he did. Oh, what have you done? <laughs> so he grabbed these, uh, they almost looked like little little cones, yeah. Yeah, isolation yeah. cones. Yeah, yeah. And he's like, all right, Mike, we're going to do like an A, B, C, D test here. We're going to go through a lot of things. So he's like, okay, just listen to this for, for a second. So I was listening. I'm like, all right, sounds beautiful. It's a beautiful system. So he's like, check this out. So he put the cones underneath. God, it was something so insignificant too. It was, uh, uh, it wasn't even the amp. It was, uh, it was just some component he had in there going on the streamer. I think it was something. Mm -hmm. And I heard a difference. Yeah. It was just a, a little more lively. And then he's like, well, check this out. Then he put it under the amplifier and then he put it under something else. And then three things were elevated. <clears throat> and if you take the sound that I heard from the or original before it was, you know, on the isolation, uh, on the isolation feet to, 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 to this night and day. Okay. So I, I felt the isolation coach did a little bit more, had a little bit more of an effect. What do you think about that than the, than the, than the, than the cables? Well, it all depends upon. So for example, um, if, if the AC is already pretty clean and there isn't much in the way of, of, of devices in the room uh, creating RFI, mm -hmm. um, the AC cable may not have as much a job to do as it otherwise might in other environments and other circumstances. It mm -hmm. could very well be that the resonant cones, not, I'm sure the shelf it was on was very good, but there may have been some vibration of a transformer nearby. Now, it shouldn't be that extreme, but it's always possible. Um, uh, and, and, and there's a point, too, where in some ways you never know. I mean, it, it's, it's hard to be certain as to what may be having a cause uh, that results in the effect. And, 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 and so being listened to this, and of course, we're going into deep waters now where there will be people that will say that this oh, is not possible. Yeah, we'll be, we'll, we'll be burned at the stake for all this. We're yeah. This, this is and the, and, but the thing <laughs> is, is that there are, there are cases where it may not have an effect. There are cases where you may not be able to hear the effect or that effect may be not large enough to matter to you. And therefore, at that point, that's the beauty of what we're participating in here, that it is beyond my comprehension. There is as much music as there is out there in the world and that there is someone that wants to listen to it. 
There is stuff that I would never think of listening to in my life. And yet there's lots of it. And lots of it to the sense that obviously people want to listen to this. And it's the same way with audio components, kind of in the same thing. There's all of this variety of stuff that we should be celebrating instead of uh, treating it so negatively. Um, but I think there's this effort that people have or this desire that people have is to save others you know, from bad audio. Um, when in actual fact, we should kind of celebrate it and, 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 and talk about how it's something to check out for yourself. Uh, and that's why we're really big on the, the concept of just listen. Um, our friends at Audio Vector have that as their, as their marketing slogan. Um, and it couldn't be a truer sentiment for them or for us is that you just need to listen to this stuff. And if it makes a difference for you, then it's all up to you then to buy it. If it doesn't, then you don't have to buy it. One of my favorite things that I'd love to do is, is people would come into me as a salesman to say they needed new speakers. And even though I had the opportunity to sell them a pair of new speakers, most people left. If they were using stand-mounted speakers, they left with new stands. Mm -hmm. And like the demo you got, I would give them an A-B demo. I even would ask them to bring their speakers and their stands in if they were willing. And you would swap them out, um, and they would hear the difference. And in a lot of cases, it is simply allowing yourself to listen. Um, and I'm off on a really bad tangent, but that's why I love uh, women customers. They didn't care about reviews. They didn't care about specs. But if it made a difference in how the stuff sound, that's really all that mattered to them. Whereas I think as men, we kind of get all jammed up mm -hmm. with worrying that we're not going to make the right choice, not trusting our ears, um, uh, and believing somehow the specifications tell us how something will sound. Um, specifications testing is really critical when you're designing a product um, and is good to have performance aspects confirmed by say reviewers but ultimately um, the rubber hits the road when you listen to it because that's what you're going to do with it well um, I think the naysayers you know the naysayers are, I, I, I would say I don't want to throw a number out there but I'd say about 75% or more mm -hmm. have never done what I did Go to a hi-fi mm -hmm. shop, mm -hmm. sit down and ask for an A-B test or, or or at least show the interest. I think they are just naysayers because they're naysayers. They're like, oh, that doesn't make sense to my brain and the science isn't there and blah, blah, blah. It's all snake oil. And I hate that word, by the way, snake oil. It's, yeah, me too. It sets, it sets up rather unpleasant images. Doesn't well, it? now there, there is some stuff out there that's, that, that I, would, I wouldn't even touch. You know, I'd be like, okay, that's that's... A, too expensive, and B, I don't think it's going to have that big of a difference. But, and, and there's companies out there that take advantage of that. You know, there, there's, there, are, there are companies out there that are disingenuous and, and will take advantage of people for, for not knowing or not wanting to, uh, to do that A-B test thing. Mm -hmm. But for the basics, we're, you know, and it seems that Primair and, and you, importantly, <clears throat> are worried and, and very, very concerned about the the electrical signal, you know, mm. you've done a lot to clean that up, you know, to make it as, and that, okay. And that can kind of segue into my opinion of my first. Okay. So <laughs> I was using a, an, an SACD player and we'll get into that because I do not even own an SACD. I can't find one for the life of me. So <laughs> I had a Sony SACD player, a five disc carousel, six or five, five or six disc carousel. So I took that out. Right. And I liked the way my Sony sounded. I liked it. I, I, I was happy with it. You know, and it was a carousel for Christ's sakes. Yeah, and it was a carousel. <laughs> a couple, a couple of my qualms with it was it was a little. It was older, so it was a little loud. You mm -hmm. know, you could hear it, and, and the sound was okay. I was using it as a transport, not a player. So I was running into a, um, a external DAC. However, I unboxed. After I did my, my video unboxing of your, I did film the unboxing experience and I, I was very impressed. Uh, right, the, the design alone, I mean, come on, the design alone is, is incredible. It's, it's, it's a beautiful design. Thanks. Down to the font that you used oh. in, 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 the, in, the, in the LCD. Like that's something people don't really notice. And I, I will bring that up in my review that I. We that spend I, so much time on that. I mean, it would, you, you would find it very funny to see the pictures of all of us kind of looking at the LED. And, I and, loved it. Yeah. Absolutely. Thanks. I think it's clean. It's very Euro, very cool, clean, minimalist. Minimalist is important. And it's a very nice minimalist player, small, compact, mm -hmm. 
gorgeous aesthetically architecturally gorgeous okay so aside from it being the sexiest thing alive i i took my my cd and i and i put it in and the slot load is so cool you just it just grabs it from you you know yeah. just takes really? it and accepts it you know? yeah. <laughs> and it's what, almost what, eager to play the disc what blew me away first and foremost is how quiet the operation is mm. almost silent you know most yeah. cd players yep. you can you, you, you can hear it this thing you can't even hear it yeah. <laughs> if you're standing from here to there I, I i couldn't tell you if it was on or off you know so that was number one number two the sound quality mm. I, I was okay transport to transport i was like okay i might hear some stuff it's but you know it's well built you know the you know it's probably a lot that goes in there that's going to make it sound a little bit better but how much better was staggering mm. the clarity it almost felt like you took my music and you cleaned it really 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 well and it just came out bright and shiny and beautiful <laughs> and i was like there's no way there's no way. So I, I, I use different CDs. I tried mm -hmm. different things and I, I was using my, uh, my Dolly Oberon threes to as reference to test the, 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 the unit, which I am going to use different speakers down the road. And it's funny that, you know, my friend Mads over at audio vector, he's a good guy. Uh, because those, uh, he's just, across, he's just across the bridge in Copenhagen. In fact, the person that was interrupting, uh, our, our call was, uh, Martin, their international sales manager. Oh, that's so funny. We're just, yeah. we're just, we're here in the Orison region of Southern Sweden and, and the Copenhagen area of Denmark. And there's so many great companies and we're all kind of friends and buddies. So yeah, well, yeah, one, of my, one of my first, uh, one of these that I did was with him uh, we did, mm -hmm. uh, we went, we went for like an hour and a half and we got personal and you know, we, we, it was such a good combo with him and mm -hmm. he's he, super cool guy. Uh, I'm actually kind of vibing with you the same way I vibe with him. So, um, th it's always good to interview people that you kind of get along with in, in the past. I've done interviews where actually I used to do interviews with uh, a buddy of mine. We, uh, we teamed up and we would, you know, interview companies and stuff like that. And some companies, I will not name any names, but, um, I should, but I, I don't Whoa. want to. <laughs> um, name dropped I don't want to name drop, but uh, they just looked like they were so miserable being there, you oh. know. And they were they were kind of like, and they were just they were on the the cusp of releasing this super huge new product that they've introduced mm -hmm. into the into the world of audio, over overpriced for sure. But uh, you know, I was like, why are you guys not? I'm thinking to myself, why are you guys not more excited? You're about to release you know, a really special product that could be, could have been a game changer. It, I think it fizzled out really quick, but um, they just didn't seem like they were into it. And, and I was kind of disappointed because I'm like, okay, when I talk to somebody and like, we're talking now, I like the vibe. I like to, you know, create this, this fun environment where we can kind of geek out and talk about what we love the most, which is audio. Yeah. And well, I, think, I think that has to be, that has to be part of this. I mean, because in as much as I think music is essential, audio systems aren't um you know this is a luxury good that we're dealing with and you should have fun with it it shouldn't get you into street fights and social media that kind of thing uh and then the other thing too i think the advantage and who knows i'm not sure what the company is but i bet i could guess um is that there's corporate creep and then all of a sudden the sales pressure of larger companies larger corporations it can really be tough and we're fortunate and i think matt's and martin and the guys at, at audio vector are fortunate as well we're a tiny little company Mm -hmm. We're probably the flattest managed company I've ever worked in. We really have no, we have no managing director. We have a team leader. We all function and run the company as a team. We're all intimately involved in obviously our specialization, but in virtually every aspect of the product. And so we're kind of emotionally invested in it all. And, and, and yet in the midst of it, because we're able to work with such cool stuff. And, I, and, and if I may brag a bit, we make some pretty cool stuff. That makes it a lot easier to get excited about it and, mm -hmm. and, and, and be a little bit more passionate about it and a little bit, and maybe also be able to be a little bit more willing to accept the fact that there's all kinds of fun stuff out there, whether it's our product or other some, someone else's product. Um, that yeah, you should grab a power cord. You should get some um, resonant feet and and zhuzh up our, our CD transport. Um, um, all of those things are are are, are really a wonderful thing. 
Um, I, did, I, I did want to share with the with oh, with, oh. with our crowd oh. that uh, this is the unit we're talking about. This is what I have in my in my home right now, um, which he'll, he's going to have to take it out of my cold dead hands at this point <laughs> because I love it so much. Um, it, it, what I okay, so right off the bat, this uh, the 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 power connection. A lot of many many players come with the power cord already connected you know you can't you can't mm. switch it out that's one of the downfalls and, and and unfortunately this picture does not show okay that's a better picture of the the top down mm-hmm. um i wanted them to see the separation on the side of it you know what i'm talking about oh the, oh the front panel yeah the front yeah panel. the front panel is separated from the actual yeah, the unit. Offset, uh, yeah. and well they'll and just, they'll just have, have to go to but they'll have to buy one and take a look at it yeah. Well, what's also cool is that your other, um, like you have a phono preamp, you have preamps, you have network yeah. players, you have integrated amplifiers. And what's cool is they all look alike. So if someone wants to enter uh, the ecosystem of Primaire and, and just do everything Primaire, it's going to look really, really nice and uniform mm-hmm. in, in, in a person's media center or media rack. And I think that's yeah. very important, you know? Well, we designed it system building. Uh, we designed mm-hmm. it for system building. And so like in our bigger stuff, it's actually modular. You can decide whether you put a DAC in or a network player and that kind of stuff. And then with the 15 series, it we designed all these different products so that you can mix and match as uh, to suit the needs of your system um, mm-hmm. as you need it. And so obviously it goes all together. And the other thing that you may not have noticed is that the 15 series, even though it's three quarter size, the front panel buttons line up with the full size product. So those four little front panel buttons line up so that even if you set them, even not necessarily even on top of each other, but together they all have this look and feel so that even though they're different sizes, uh, they look good. And um, and then I did want to mention something too about the display. You were talking about the quality display. The other thing that I love about that display, and it took us a long time to find that as well, and we sourced that as well from the auto industry, is that that will last forever. Hmm. Um, it's fourth generation OLED built for the automobile industry. So again, within those ex- uh, temperature extremes, those conditions, it will last forever. We had some early experience with early OLEDs and OLEDs will begin to leak uh, to one extent or another after they're manufactured. Mm-hmm. And so we thought about putting a big display, color display, album art on the front and that kind of thing. Um, but then realized one, we weren't sure of its reliability and two, you're going to have all that information in the palm of your hand, um, uh, you know, for the most part, uh, when you're using, say, a streaming product or something like that. So, normally, normally, I wouldn't walk up to my system and, and look at the album art and everything. I think it's a cool aesthetic to have. I know other companies use that, and it's. Oh, it's, I'm a little jealous of it. I have to admit, because it looks really sexy on the shelf. There's no it, doubt it about does. it. You, it, you it get, does. If you get two, three meters away. It doesn't have much use value. Yeah, I have yeah. to be like, what, what does that say? Uh, you're right. Most things are going to be in the palm of your hand or on, on your in your tablet or even on your computer uh, with your room core or whatnot. Um, I use my room core on my PC because it's, mm-hmm. it's capable enough. But um, now I kind of wish I would have separated it because, uh, you know, when I'm when I'm because I have a rune endpoint uh, on my nightstand mm-hmm. where I have a, a little headphone amp. And I'm like, oh, God, I got to go turn on my computer and turn on Rune just to listen to music now. I think that's yeah. the only downfall, but I'd rather have it just running all the time. Mm-hmm. But um, uh, yeah, but as I was saying about the the uniform look mm-hmm. of your products, now to, to elaborate on that, you guys are a one-stop shop. So you have power amplifiers. You have pre-amplifiers. You have integrated amplifiers. Um. Which I mean, if I if it, if I were doing it right, I would go power amplifier, pre amplifier, um, and and then either network player or the the CD thirty five, which has the network player and the CD player, and and I would be done. That would that those three components could provide someone with everything they need, you know. As, and don't discount the integrated because what's what's absolutely fascinating is that. Um, there's a, there's a certain advantage in having things integrated. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and people will integrate other circuit topologies, like some will add headphones, some will add uh, phono stages, that kind of stuff. And, and because digital 
is not as easy as some people might think. It's certainly not as easy as analog, even though analog isn't easy. But with digital, everything has to be precise. Everything has to be exactly right for it to perform at its best. Mm -hmm. And so even that exchange, like one of the things, and I hate to say this, with the DD15, one of the issues that you might have with it is that you have that digital connecting cable. And so you'll need to have that cable be as good as it possibly can, making sure that it's a 75 ohm connector, making sure that it's 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 draped carefully and, and correctly within your system to make sure that that exchange happens as cleanly and perfectly as it possibly could. Whereas if it's in your DAC or in your, your network player is internal, or in the case of CD35, the DAC and the network player is internal, we've managed that interconnection and we've managed that interface. And so there can be some advantages there. So so whether it's one that of the no amps or the preamp and amp. Hmm? That way there's no worry. You yeah. Know, way, you don't have to worry there's about no it. variable. I mean, obviously I'm using, you know, the, the, well, I haven't tried it with optical yet. Um, I'm only, uh, I've only used the coax, but my optical cable is actually a higher tier. I got, I'm using the carbon, um, mm. which I think I went a little too overkill, but, uh, yeah. I, I like it. I think it sounds good. Uh, and I think I'm using, like, like, I think I'm using like the cinnamon on the, on the coax. I didn't want to go crazy on the coax, mm -hmm. but, um, I, I, I haven't had a desire because it sounds so good. <laughs> yeah. Well, and understand too, I mean, Toslink is a great system, mm -hmm. um, uh, but it does have some limitations. Um, it was designed to be 2496. You can get 2492 transfer with it, but everything, mm -hmm. the wind has to be at your back and everything has to be kind of lined up correctly. Um, so our recommendation, oh, and you have to make sure that the cable is in any way kinked or bent in a way that might uh, limit transfer. Uh, so Toslink, while it can sound very, very good, uh, coax is our, pr our preference when you're going to connect with the, the DD15. Um, okay. And the other thing, too, is that there are just so many coaxial digital cables out there to choose from that it allows you to really kind of select exactly the one that you prefer. Mm -hmm. and, and I mentioned I went with AudioQuest because I, I trust their, their mm -hmm. process. You know, I, I've seen some cool videos on how they <laughs> they put cool. things together, and it, it, it's, it's really good. And, and obviously my brother, you know, beating it into my skull that, you know, I should I should trust trust the process of AudioQuest. But... <laughs> Um, well, and it is a case, and the thing is, is so you've got so you've got access to Isotech, you've got access to Nordos, you've got access to AudioQuest, and so within, and then you have more importantly access to a good dealer, and mm -hmm. that's the thing that I think is probably more important than anything else, is is is, is if at all possible. And I know it's getting harder and harder as time goes on, and I know that the retail landscape in the United States is difficult, having lived in that environment for so many years myself. But regardless of the nature of the deal you have access to really work with them, I would say. Uh, it'll be to your mutual advantage. Um, mm -hmm. and work with them in the case of actually buy stuff from them. If people don't buy stuff from them, they won't be there for you to be able to listen, for you to be able to experience yourself, for you to maybe be able to borrow equipment, try it in your own system. It's really critical to provide them support. It's a virtuous circle Mm -hmm. um, that that we really can't lose in the day, I know, especially with the pandemic, of online delivery of anything at any time. Um, and as you suggest, uh, there's some great people out there that you can work with, become friends with possibly, mm -hmm. um, as you build this wonderful system. And it is a case of kind of building it bit by bit and that you can't necessarily buy it. It's not something where you just look at the most expensive thing you can afford and pull that from the shelf and say, this will work. Oftentimes, um, and, and if you're working with a dealer like Soundings, they will recommend to you things that may be more cost effective than what you might have thought that actually might work better in your circumstance mm -hmm. or suggest something else. It could be that there's something you need to be doing to your system. For example, if you're streaming, really attend to your network, your home network. Um, just because you can surf the internet and just because you can do even a video call like this doesn't mean that that system isn't working in top form to be able to provide you with the best sound from that format. Mm -hmm. um, all of it matters. And so whether it's the nature of your router, you should always, we believe, I know people will object to this, have a switch uh, between your router. Um, and then we tend to prefer ethernet connection when possible. Um, there is certainly theoretically Wi-Fi should be better because you don't have the issues of just the wire noise. Um, however, in a lot of cases, the Wi-Fi connection just simply isn't quite up to what it needs to be uh, to provide the best performance. So right yeah. at the moment, cable will be better. Yeah. So all that stuff is important. 
it, it all works together. You know, uh, sometimes yeah. you're only as good as your weakest link, unfortunately, yeah. you know, and one, one small, one small issue can cause a domino effect and, and really ruin your experience. That's why it's good to, to trust guys like, you know, at, at soundings who, who know what they're talking about, have, have the experience, have been in the business a long time. And, mm-hmm. you know, I didn't feel sales pitchy when I went there. Yeah. You know, I, well, I, yeah. yeah. You're sharing, I mean, they're sharing information. The information that they share and the experience that they provide should do that job for them. Right. Um, um, a sale pitch is never very comfortable. But it is the kind of thing, too, where just getting tips and tricks and, and learning how to do things. And you were talking about, you know, the importance of things like cable and power uh, conditioners and, 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 and resonant feet. Um, I'm a, uh, in, 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 during the pandemic, I've been doing this nightly cocktail thing to try to quit working at the end of the day. Mm-hmm. And, 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 and as kind of a metaphor, what has been amazing to me is how important garnish is. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And so you've made this cocktail and whether it's a couple of dashes of Angostura bitters, or it is a twist of, of lime or, or, or squeeze of lime or a twist of lemon, or, you know, you all of a sudden discover that actually a a dill pickle spear in this actually works really, really well. Mm -hmm. Um, But it is that last little component that brings it all together. And so you can have this otherwise great cocktail and you add that last element and everything then just becomes more harmonically coherent, if you will, Mm -hmm. uh, on a flight profile. So it could very well be that you have all this great kit, but it just doesn't have that last little thing that really locks everything in in, in focus and provides that level of performance. There's only so much we can do in building in our CD transports. Um, You have to to be careful in its care and feeding. (laughs) Right. Well, I mean... And like I mentioned before, you guys can do it all, you know. Uh, we, we, we stop at certain things. Um, um, people are pressing us to do headphones. People want us to do turntables. People want us to do an, any number of different things. Um, and we try to work within the field that we feel we have the expertise, the experience that allows us to be successful at it. So electronics is key for us. And obviously now almost any electronics manufacturer has to become not just a hardware manufacturer, but a software um, a builder as well. And so that's something that we're working hard with and learning to understand and, 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 and I think learning valuable lessons, uh, because even the way we've set up our, our streaming system, our network player system is that our app does only two basic functions. It sets up the product, customizes it, um, uh, with the kind of the menu in your hand, the settings menu in your hand, and it controls a local area NAS. it controls a NAS drive. Everything else, every streaming service is handled through that particular streaming services app so that you have that direct connection to the user interface that that you've grown comfortable with perhaps or that you might prefer. And then you cast to our product either with AirPlay, Chromecast, or in the case of Spotify, you use Connect. Um, You can also use Bluetooth. And the importance for us in that is understanding our limitations and understanding what's really important and what we're capable of doing. Because what that allows us to do is step away uh, from having to add another layer of software on top of that already complicated exchange, that complicated relationship between the operating system of, say, your Android or iOS device, the uh, streaming service that you're using, and the casting service. If we try to embed all of that into our app, there's that next layer of software we would be responsible for. And I don't know if you've noticed, but these updates come pretty fast. And so in the case of Apple iOS 13, I believe there were 18 updates in a year before they went to iOS 14. Um, And some of those updates, no consequence for streaming. But one of them made Spotify freeze if you typed in a Serbian alphabet character. And of course, if your Spotify quits working on your primary product, the first person you're going to contact is Prime Air. And we're going to have to try to figure out what the heck is going on that would cause Serbian alphabet characters to freeze Spotify. Mm -hmm. And as it turns out, it was something that Spotify had to do to work with the new Apple iOS. But all of those little interactions are really vital. And especially today, you know, so when we're talking about system building, you have to be concerned about everything. Um, and the favorite story I have about this, particularly when it comes to networking, there was a village in Wales. You might have heard about this. There's a village in Wales where at seven in the morning, every day, everyone in the village would lose internet service. Everyone. It would just go away. 
It took three engineering teams over a year and a half to discover that it was one man's older television that he turned on every morning to get the news from the BBC World Service at seven. Oh. And the great thing I love about this is that they investigated it. They tried to figure out what the cause was. And finally, they determined the best solution was just to buy him a new TV because they couldn't figure it out. They couldn't figure out why. And so this was a, a massive telecom company trying to figure this out. And so there are these connections, there's these interactions that, that you can never anticipate. And so no matter how carefully you work on your software, it's only until you get it out there in these multitude and multiplicity of systems and the different interactions that you'll find that there might be a conflict here or a conflict there. And no one's immune to it. Um, Primer is not the only one. It's always difficult to get all these things to work. Otherwise, why would there be all these updates from everyone all the time? Mm -hmm. And so there is that nature that we really like focusing on hardware because that's what we've done for a long time. And we've done everything. We've built tube amps for Copeland. We've done class A, class A B amps. Um, uh, we now do, of course, class D amps. Um, and, and we really feel that over time, we've developed this philosophy of the primacy of the power supply the simplest possible circuit path, and we make every effort. When you show the internal picture of there, you'll see that we use surface mount components. So you avoid, you know, on a standard component, you have the resistor itself, and then you have those metal legs that come out of it that have to go through a socket in the circuit board. And then that socket is filled with solder. And so that you have all of that intervening metal, solder, the legs between that component and the circuit board. And so in surface mount, it lies directly on the board. Mm. It has direct contact and the solder is there only to hold it in place, not to provide any sort of connection whatsoever. And so we use four layer circuit boards in conjunction with the surface mount to limit and make sure that that signal path is as small and small as we can possibly make it. Even our, even our RCA connectors, you probably saw the digital RCA connector on the back of the, of the DD15. You could look at that and think it's relatively an inexpensive looking connector. And I would proudly say, yes, it is. But it's also one of the best sounding connectors you're going to ever run across because it's also one of the simplest. And it is literally just bent metal that attaches directly to that circuit board. So there's no intervening extraneous wire solder to impede the progress of that signal from the circuit out to your connector and then out to your DAC. And so it's attention to all those little details um, that's fundamentally important when we design anything. And, and so whether it's a basic amp, a preamp, integrated amps, phono stage, um, DAC, CD player, stuff like that. Um, uh, a lot of work goes into making it as simple as we possibly can. That's what I feel is it sets you guys apart, you know, from, from many other companies is, not only are you guys a small outfit, so there's obviously more passion, love, time that goes into your products, but the attention to detail, you know, mm -hmm. down to the, down to the font, Yeah, you know, and a lot of people wouldn't, wouldn't really bring that up. I mean, I know I'm, I, I, I don't feel silly, but I know probably people are probably like, why is he freaking out about this font? Like what's the, you, you guys are going to have to watch my, my review video and find out what the font looks like. But, um, yeah, it, it, the font is, is beautiful. It's just a beautiful font. And th those small details matter because many companies would have just dismissed it, been like, oh yeah, you use whatever, who cares? Who gives a crap what, what, what we use, but you guys literally from front to back, top to bottom, uh, you created a machine that is absolutely, I love that little light too, by the way, that's a, that, that, that's also a good touch. The little standby light right there. Um, and, and the level well, of its output was very carefully, again, funny pictures of us in darkened rooms, seeing if that was too bright or too, too low. It's perfect. And the cool thing is I like it. I like the white that you use. It's not like a, a traditional white. It's just like this. This I can't even describe the the white you guys use. It's, just, it's an Arctic white. It, Arctic. There we go. That's a perfect name. For a it. Scandinavian white. Yeah, Scandinavian well, white. But, I have. To, I, I will. I will definitely tell Bent um, of our conversation as I would anyway. But mm. we've done a little film about Bent, and Bent. I, I. I. I could talk probably too much about Bent, but Bent is one of those guys that, as everyone for the most part on the team is all about the attention to that detail and that and that it goes even beyond the fact of it being kind of um, symbolic of maybe the more critical attention to detail of the circuit inside because bent is one of those people along with myself that believes that again all of this matters 
And so we believe that the way the product looks, the way it feels, uh, the controls, the, the amount of time we spent on the pressure that it takes to activate the front panel buttons. Hmm. All of that is important to us. The, you don't have a knob on the DD15, uh, but even the tension that's on the volume knob or the selector knob on those products that have knob, all of that matters. And we believe that there has to be that, that not necessarily even a sense of pride, but, but, but kind of appealing to all of the senses um, that's really critical in your enjoyment. And someone could talk about this as being a placebo effect, but to a certain degree, we kind of live in a placebo world. We're all affected by this level of appearance. And, and so if that, it provides a little greater satisfaction, that's really all that we're, uh, that we're concerned about is making sure that, that that as I'm looking at the products at the, on my rack now, <laughs> thinking, yeah, they are pretty attractive. Um, but all of it comes from a practical point. So like for, for example, you're talking about that, that the, the facade, the front plate standoff mm -hmm. that developed as a signature design way back. And and we looked at it as the products evolved, and it became in the days when your like display circuitry could cause some noise, that became the spot where we put all of that display circuitry. So it was in its own isolated chamber, so that it didn't inject the noise into the system. Um, from the very early days, with the very first product we made back in eighty five, eighty six, we had remote control. When remote control was considered to be just about as anti high end as you could possibly be. This was in the days of chunky resistive, you know, they would actually have individual resistors on the volume knobs as you turned it. It was like turning the turret on a tank. It was, and this was the, this was the epitome of high end. And while we had that resistive ladder control, we also had remote control because we knew that that experience would be made that much better by being able to sit in your listening chair and adjust the volume mm -hmm. instead of having to get up and adjust the volume, whether you might have it set for the entire duration of the recording or whether you wanted to make adjustments as you went along. All of that matters, um, how it looks, how it feels, how it sounds, all of that matters. And then the other thing for, for, for us that you've already hit on is this idea of that it's a, it's a system and it's only as strong as it's chain. Mm -hmm. and, and part of it comes, and this is gonna sound very strange, but part of it comes almost from a Scandinavian culture of equality. Um, there's a term here in Sweden that everyone knows and you hear it all the time and it's called log and it means many, many things. Uh, but ultimately what it means is just balance, not too much, not too little. Um, and even socially, there is this idea. And in fact, it can sometimes be a little bit negative because there is that sense that you should never self-promote. You are no better than anyone else, but by the reverse, no one else is better than you. And so there is this idea that within the social system, the social network, if you will, is that this level of equality, this level of access is really, really important. And we feel the same way about our products. We design our products so that regardless of the system, whether it's primary or otherwise, you should be able to put that product into the system. The system should be made better, mm -hmm. but you should never be able to identify it as a primary sound. You should never, it should never draw attention to itself. It should be part of that system working to make it that much better and without necessarily um, revealing that it's at work there. And so, so that guides us in every effort to have this kind of neutral musicality. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we want to make sure that we get every last little detail, but we also want to make sure that it's coherent and that it provides a sense of life. Um, of, 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 of realism. And it also means too, that we try as far as this access goes, we want to make sure that everyone in the household can use the system. And it's one of the reasons why Prisma is designed so that you actually just work through the app. So if you have a, a son or daughter that uses Spotify, great. They can connect with Spotify. They can use the app that they've already used. If you're using Tidal or Cobuzz for higher resolution, then that's yours. That's separate. You have that interface. Or in the case of my household where my poor wife, who was, uh, when I met her, she was a dancer. She went on to be a nationally ranked figure skater, is a flautist, loves music, but never in the 35 years we were married ever touched my sound system until I got a Google Home Mini and voice control. And all of a sudden, she doesn't feel like she will break the system by just talking to it. And so all of a sudden, I come home now, and the, when, I'm, when I was at the office, I come home now to hear music that I otherwise would never have heard. 
And that's the important thing is this idea of access about everybody being able to use the system, everyone enjoying it. We try, even though I know our products aren't cheap, we try to keep them as reasonably priced as we possibly can to provide that best possible experience to the greatest number of people. And so all of that's vital to us. I'm sorry, you got me. You got me excited about talking about Primera and the things we do. Well, I'll tell you, as much as people do enjoy uh, the ceremony that is, you know, going into your system, turning everything on, adjusting everything, um, automation, that's, I think that's where we're headed um, and where people are getting more comfortable with. For example, when I, when I want something to happen here, when I want lights to turn on and off and things like that, I no longer use a light switch. I, I, yeah. I tell, I tell the young lady in, in, in my, in my device, could you please turn that off? Party and, mode. And, 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 and she does. And yeah. it, it's, it's getting to the point. I think we're at the forefront of this new revolution yeah. of, of, of automation and I think it's just going to keep going and going and going. For example, we can climate control. You can control your climate. Yeah. You can control everything. So I think it's really cool that your yeah. wife figured it out and that you you are integrated with yeah. Google Play. You can integrate with. Completely uh, screwed up my Spotify recommended playlist, though. <laughs> Because we didn't have a family account, we didn't share the account, and so it's a bit different now than what I might have uh, ordinarily expected from my recommended components. But it's mm -hmm. funny what you say about automation, because like we have this thing called AutoSense, mm -hmm. um, where um, uh, not necessarily the DD15, but in other machines, uh, control machines, integrated amps, preamps, that kind of stuff, it senses an input. It will wake itself up out of standby. It will select that input at the default volume that you have set, and we. We said so we're talking about that and how important it might be. And I'm going, well, we don't really need it for like the phono stage. You know, that's not really important for the phono mm -hmm. stage. And, and what I realized is that while we have it set up so that the phono stages remain on all the time, if you want them to, mm -hmm. um, um, I've grown so used to it that all I have to do is I just drop the needle and walk away. And the, the needle hits the uh, phono preamp opens up, sends a signal to the preamp, the preamp opens up, it's set up my volume control and I'm already you know, in the listening position by the time everything awesome. gets set up. And I, I, I'm so completely seduced by it that I, a feature I never thought I would use or care about. And you get yeah. used to those kinds of things. That's incredible. Yeah, you know, it's refreshing to see someone with such uh, passion and motivation for the company they work with. And, and that, that's cool, you know? That's Unfortunately. I'm very fortunate um, to be working with this company, living in Sweden. Um, it's a it's a wonderful experience. That's awesome. Well, Terry, uh, we've gone a little bit over our time, but that's okay because it was a wonderful conversation with you. It um, was. I, I can't I, believe we're over time. I, I think I would. I think we need to do a part two eventually. Um, actually, I, I kind of want to do a part two after I'm done with the review on that, and then after we talk about possibly. Some other well, you were talking about, about how easily these pieces stack, so maybe we should see how that works out. Uh, so, you're you're going to create a horrible addiction over here. I'm going <laughs> to. Well, I have to. I have to say, even even. Well, yeah, you should give it a try, whether you report on it or not. It. It's, oh, I mean, I. I it's well, just, just so much fun. Help. But um, well, yeah. Um, uh, hold on. I'm gonna I'm gonna cut this part. Out. I'm just gonna let you know. Just stick around for a second. I'm gonna go ahead and close this out. And sure. then I'll, uh, and we'll, we'll chat for a second. Um, all right, Terry, well, thank you so much for joining me. And, uh, you know, like I said, it was a, a grand pleasure to learn so much about your passion for primaire and, um, just, it, it's, it, isn't it, it, I think it's funny how small the community is too, because I think everybody kind of knows everybody <laughs> and, um, and that kind of stuff. Oh, real quick, before I forget, are you planning on RMAF this year? We, we, we're planning on everything this year, depending upon what opens up and what doesn't open up. Sure. Um, uh, we're looking at the schedule. The schedule is a little scary um, because there's a period where over, I think it's three weekends, there are six or seven shows. Oh, yeah. And um, and so we'll have to see. I mean, we may, we may have to leave it up to our lovely friends at MoFi Distribution to rep well represent it as Rocky Mountain. I'm pretty sure that they have plans to show us there. So whether someone for Primera is there or not, I would anticipate you could see our stuff there. Um, and um, and obviously anyone visiting Rocky Mountain should also go and, and abuse the fine folks at Soundings uh, if they get a chance, because there's all kinds of fun <laughs> stuff there. Um, but it's it's great. 
I'm sure uh, well, to think about actually getting back to shows because it is a small group and I think we all kind of miss each other even though we might be competitors it's it is kind of and that, I think that's what makes this industry so great and this hobby so great mm -hmm. is that in a lot of cases you're just sharing your passion about one of the most wonderful things in human experience which is music absolutely all right man well thank you so much for joining me and folks we will see you next monday for another edition of hi-fi hour thanks again for joining me terry my pleasure